Good morning, everyone. Happy Easter. Did you guys know that the, uh, the tomb is empty? Yeah, because he's risen. Amen. I love to hear it. So we've got just a few announcements this morning. We're going to go really, really fast. In just a few weeks, May 7th, we've got the Berean Blacktop Battle, the 8th Annual. That artwork right there is the shirt design. If you would like to get a shirt or uh, form up a team, Dream Team is uh, currently recruiting. I might have one space open, maybe, depends. So if you want to join the winning team, please come and talk to me. Um, everyone else will be competing for second place. Um, registration is $10. More information can be found in your bulletin. As well as immediately following the Blacktop Battle, this is at Cribs Youth Park, we're going to be having a, a family picnic slash outreach day from around 1 to 4. We're going to be grilling. Um, if you would like to uh, bring some more food, please come and talk to me. Uh, more information can be found in your bulletin. And finally, I just wanted to uh, talk about the... Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Today's Easter. We are going to be observing the, the Lord's Supper following uh, the service today. So just be ready to prepare your hearts for that. It's a wonderful time of, of fellowship and communion uh, and just making sure that we're right before the Lord. And immediately following that, for the little ones, we're going to be having an Easter egg hunt. It's supposed to be outside. It's not going to be outside today. Um, so kids, following the, the Lord's Supper, after everything is done, come in here for about five-ish minutes, and we're going to hide eggs in this part of the building. Not like back here where the, the praise and worship team is, but like the fellowship hall and the other classrooms. And we're going to have an area for the larger kids and for the little kids as well. And we've got a ton of eggs, so you're going to be practically tripping over them. And finally, we wrapped up another successful year of the prayer encounter this year. Uh, just wanted to hit up some statistics for you guys real quick. We had 50 cards that were laid out here, 50 cards representing prayers that were offered up by individuals that were prayed over by other people who were here at the church, um, just praying over these things. We had 32 people sign up, and we had dozens of hours of prayer, specific prayer devoted to worshiping and honoring the Lord. Um, we had 32 people who came and had their lives altered by this experience. I do not know if you could come to the prayer experience and leave unchanged. I, if you could get through the prayer experience and not cry, I, I don't know. Um, I, I'm not much of a crier myself, but that first room just, it wrecks me every single time. And if you guys have seen these vases down here, these are uh, from the prayer encounter themselves. These sands represent different colors. White for prayers for salvation for people and lives. Red for the sins in our own. Green for family issues. Orange for sickness. Yellow for communities. Blue for uh, hopelessness and brokenness. So every single bit of sand comes from somebody praying a specific prayer in those specific areas. The prayer room itself, even though the prayer encounter is it's over per se, it's not a structured event. The prayer encounter is still over here, um, that prayer room. If the church is open or if you've got a key, please come and uh, make use of that. Talk to me. Talk to Pastor Derek so we can set you up and just get you away out of the, the noise and clutter of life just so you can be one-on-one -on, -one on your face before the Lord. It's, it's great. And so we're thankful for how successful the prayer encounter was this year, and we are thankful for the empty tomb. Let's worship the Lord this morning.
word together this morning. to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead.
it's been a while since we've done this, but let's get around, shake each other's hands, and we'll come back and sing some more.
would read aloud with me for this passage. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living from the dead? He is not here. He is risen.
Heavenly Father, as we take this time, Lord, we are so thankful, Lord God, that not only you died on the cross for our sins, but yet that you conquered death and gave the victory and rose again on the third day. Lord God, there's just so many things that we should be thankful for. And as Pastor brings the message that you've laid on his heart for us today, help us to remember that no matter what, you have conquered all. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. All right. Well, good morning, church. Man, today, I don't know, just your singing was so good. I could hear everybody from behind me and just hear your voices being uplifted to the Lord. And as we cry out to God and as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, we think of the culmination of, of this whole past week. I mean, last week we, we, we were talking about the, the, the triumphal entry when Jesus enters in through the gates of Jerusalem and people are, are bowing down and they're laying palm branches before him and they're crying out, Hosanna, save now. And then everything that Jesus would teach over the next several days and as he would foreshadow um, the, the coming uh, crucifixion, everything that happened and then the culmination of, of the, at least the part uh, of, for Jesus uh, for the taking of our sin upon himself on that Friday and then coming off of that cross, being buried in a tomb, being laid in that tomb. But today, everything has changed. Today, we celebrate the resurrection, that there is victory over death, that Jesus has conquered the grave, that he has come so that we might have life. He said that have come that he might have it more abundantly. And this morning, as we celebrate that abundant life, that joy that was in Christ, man, I could just hear it in your voices as we call out. And I hope that it's so much more, though, than just a song. I hope that what we were saying and the things that we were experiencing and what we were feeling on the inside is a result of what God is doing in us and through us as he is bringing us into ever closer union with the Father through the sacrifice of Jesus, through the conquering of death, so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be free, so that we could have real life. Easter Sunday, Easter Sunday, we celebrate the fact that Christ is risen. Three words, Christ is risen. Three words and one day that changed the world. As we began our worship service this morning, we started with a video and it focused our attention upon the difference that a day makes. Did you notice that in that video it's talking about Saturday? What was the mood? What was happening? What was going on? What was happening on Saturday? And one of the lines that was in that video, in fact, I want to kind of recall our attention to two of the lines that were in that video. The one line was this, on Saturday, there was debt, there was, de there was <laughs> defeat, doubt, and death. On Saturday, there was defeat, doubt, and death. And that's so very true. On Saturday, there really wasn't a lot of hope. In fact, I would say that the world was devoid of hope. There was no hope. There was no better tomorrow. There wasn't really even wishful thinking. Everybody there saw Jesus die upon the cross. And his death was preceded by those two little words, those three little words, it is finished. And when Jesus uttered those words, they watched as his body sank. And the Bible says that he gave up his spirit. He was dead. And everybody there at Golgotha that day saw the death of the Messiah, the king, the one that they had just lauded and proclaimed as he entered into the gates of Jerusalem, but he died on that cross. And so, yeah, there was definitely doubt. There was definitely defeat. There was definitely the presence of death. From there, the Roman soldiers took Jesus' body, placed him in a tomb. It would be guarded. And they thought it was the end. But it was not the end. Because there was another line from that video that we, that we looked at just a second ago, and that line was this, but on Sunday, there was a rumble of victory. This morning, we're going to take a look one more time at the familiar account of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a passage that I never get tired of reading because it is a passage of victory. But as we read this passage this morning, I want you to think about two contrasting tones that are present. You could think of it as Saturday and Sunday if you want. But there's two different feelings, two different emotions, two different understandings. One which is real, the other which was not. Okay? 
So if we think of on Saturday, we think of confusion, uncertainty, defeat, doubt, and death. But the other tone is a tone of confidence and a tone of victory. So I want you to be thinking through these two contrasting emotions, these contrasting tones, these contrasting feelings that are present in this narrative, in this historical account of what took place that Sunday morning. And as we're given a little bit of a glimpse into the thinking and into the lives of those individuals who would be a part of this resurrection story as far as witnesses, as far as being there at the tomb. So open your Bibles or Bible apps with me this morning. We're going to be in John chapter 20. Uh, We're going to be reading verses 1 through 18. And as we look back at this account, I'm also going to bring in a little bit of additional information that we find from the other Gospels so that we can have a little bit fuller picture of the events that first Easter morning. Each of the Gospels records uh, the account of Easter morning, and some of them add extra details depending upon uh, the perspective from who is writing, um, and that just makes sense, okay, as, as each of them um, are, are either interviewing or being there present, looking at different things, and so you're given extra details, and so you want to read all of those things together if you want to, to, to see the entirety of uh, the Easter account. So I'm going to do, do an attempt to bring in at least some of those significant things even as we read John chapter 20, all right? So John chapter 20, we're going to start in verse number 1. I'm going to read the entirety uh, of the passage, and we're going to break it down a little bit. But I want you to be thinking about those contrasting tones, all right? Death, defeat, doubt, okay? But then confidence and victory. John chapter 20, starting in verse 1. The Bible says, Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark, and she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead, then the disciples went away again to their homes. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that she had spoken these things, and that he had spoken these things to her. Now, as we read through this text, you probably picked up at least a little bit of those two different sets of emotions that were present. Confusion, uncertainty, what's happening, what's going on, but then also an air of confidence and victory. We're gonna look at some of this, some more of these. One set of these emotions or feelings was based upon what was perceived to be true. And I want you to think about that. One set of things was based upon what was perceived to be true. The other was based upon what really was true. Think about that for just a second. Perceptions versus reality. Mary Magdalene had come to the tomb along with Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and others according to the Gospel of Luke. And so we're given a little bit of additional detail of who was there present with Mary Magdalene at the time. 
And the Bible says they came to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body with spices. And so we see the reason that they're come. They're not just coming to, to commemorate that there's a specific role that was part of Jewish custom uh, with the burial process. And so they are coming to anoint the body with spices uh, for the entombment uh, of Jesus. And so the perceptions of each of these women was that Jesus was dead, correct? Okay. They are bringing spices, they are coming to fulfill uh, the normal practice of, of uh, preparing the body and, and waiting and, and anointing uh, that body so that it can be officially entombed and can, can stay that way. So on the way to the tomb, the Gospel of Mark records even a conversation where the women who are going there uh, to anoint the body are wondering who's going to roll the stone out of the way for them to be able to anoint the body of Jesus because the stone is heavy and they're like okay um how how are we going to do this we know it's guarded by the Romans um and but they'll let us in but is that going to be enough can they roll this this stone away and so when they actually do make it to the tomb and the stone is already rolled away they're quite confused because they're not supposed to roll the stone away until somebody is there to prepare the body with those spices that's the whole point. Leave it sealed until the people that are coming to prepare the body ask to roll it away so they can do their job. And they look and they wait a minute. And what's going through their head, we don't necessarily know because we don't have their thoughts recorded, but they're probably thinking, did somebody else come and do this? Okay. And then the, the next immediate thought is like, somebody come and took the body away because that is recorded in Scripture. And so like, uh-oh, there's, there's a ton of confusion. And Luke tells us that at that point, they enter into the tomb. They see that the, the stone is rolled away, and so they go into the tomb to try and figure out what in the world is going on. Has somebody already come and, and taken care of Jesus' body? Okay. They're greatly perplexed, the Bible says, and it's then that they see these, these angels, these two angels, who ask the famous question, why do you seek the living among the dead? This just adds to the confusion, right? Okay, they're like, okay, what, why is the stone moved? where's Jesus' body, and who are these two people, and why are they talking about Jesus being alive? Because we know that he died. We saw him. So there's a million questions flying around, doubts, wondering, what in the world is happening? The living, what? Jesus died. We saw him die on the cross. And who are you, by the way? <laughs> As you look at the angels, their perceptions did not match the reality of the resurrection of Jesus. They did not have any comprehension of what had just transpired. What they thought had, had happened and what they thought was the end was most definitely not the end. Have you ever been confused about something? Have you ever just scratched your head and wondered, what just happened? There's been a few occurrences in my life where I've just been totally perplexed and came to that place where you're like, I don't have a clue. I don't have a clue. And what's happening with the women, they don't have a clue. So then what happens with them? Well, the women go back and tell Peter and John about what they had just experienced with all of their <laughs> perplexed thoughts. They were perplexed about what they'd been told. And here in the Gospel of John, we read that once they are, the women come back and they tell Peter and then the other one that is with him is John. He's recording his own words. And so the other one that was with him, that's referencing John. And so once they tell them about the empty tomb, they're like, um, we got to see this for ourselves because we, we, we haven't put the pieces together yet either. And so they are also very confused. They don't, that doesn't make any sense. Why would that happen? And so the Bible says they get into a foot race. John outruns Peter, getting to the tomb first. Peter catches up. They both look into the tomb and they see the burial cloths. They see a facial covering like a handkerchief. But Jesus' body is not there. Now, there's a lot of significance that goes into even the handkerchief. Um, just kind of give you the overview. In, in Jewish customs and tradition, as you go to a meal and you have the, the cloth that you would use, kind of like a napkin, that if you're coming back, um, that you're going to, to fold it up, okay, because you're going to use it again. And so you'd fold it up and you'd put it in its place. But if you're done with your food and you're not coming back to the table, you wad it up and you just throw it down, okay? And so Jesus took the burial cloth, and it's very, the Bible is very specific. The cloths are lying there, but the facial handkerchief is folded and set aside. There, there's some great symbolism there. Jesus is saying, I'm coming back, okay? He says, I will be coming again. This is not the end. I'm coming again. And so 
all of this is happening. Jesus' body is there, is not there. What happened? This can't be right. Confusion, uncertainty. And for just a moment, I want you to step away from the historical account of that empty tomb and think about your own life. Okay? Think about that time when you were extremely confused. Okay? Think about that time when life was uncertain. And it could be any, any reason. But just think about the experience of uncertainty and how unnerving it is, right? You don't know what's up, what's down. Maybe it's a, it's a situation with uh, marital situation. Maybe it's a financial situation. Maybe a situation where somebody, somebody died unexpectedly and just seemed like everything came crashing down, right? Okay, everything in life just had a huge question mark hanging over it. Okay, uncertainty and confusion. You wonder what's really true? What's really right? Why would this happen? How could this happen? What, God, what are you doing? All right? And again, each of us has a different story. Each of us has a different recollection, but we have all been there. Okay? Again, maybe tragedy, loss of a loved one, unwanted divorce. Maybe the doctor said it's cancer. Uncertainty. Life did not seem fair. Why? If God is good, why did that happen? And whatever that that is in your life. Have you ever been there? Why did that happen? If you've been there, let me say, you're in good company. Because if we're honest, to one degree or another, we've all been there. I may not have experienced the same level of loss or the same type of loss, the same type of occurrence that you have felt, but I too have been there. Our perceptions of what should be didn't match the reality of what we were facing in that moment. Do you understand? Those feelings of confusion and uncertainty is the difference between perception and reality. Because in our life, we want things to go easy. We want things to go well. We want things to be straight. We want things to be clear. We want to be happy. We want to be joyous. We want to enjoy the good things of this world. But you know what? There is such thing as sin. And because of sin... A lot of times that picture gets messed up. And what I want, those good things, sometimes it does not turn out that way. My perception, this is what I want. But the reality says I am experiencing something far less than what I desire. The difference between perception and reality. And every time that those two things don't coincide, every time that what I want doesn't match up with what I'm experiencing, it causes uncertainty doubt, confusion, all sorts of stuff that we really don't like going through. Whenever you face struggles, doubts, and uncertainties in life, guess what that means? It means you're human. It means that we're human. This is common to all of our existence. But you know, those feelings of uncertainty and confusion those weren't the only two emotions present that first Easter morning, and they weren't lasting emotions. And let me just also say that those times and those periods where life does not make sense, when life does not seem fair, let me also just say it doesn't last forever. That is not what God wants for you. Okay? Now, you will experience struggles because it is common to our existence. But God wants you to see victory in your life, not just for the sake of victory, but for the sake of proclaiming the goodness of God. That he is able to conquer the most difficult periods of our life. He is able to bring life out of death. He is able to bring us through the fire. He is able to transform us, to change us from the inside out, to give us hope when there is no hope. Because that's the nature of our God. Not to leave us in despair, but to bring us the greatest of hope. So that Easter morning, yeah, there's a lot of confusion on the parts of basically everybody involved. But there's also an air of confidence, belief, certainty, perhaps even victory that's present. If you look at verses 8 and 9, we begin to see a little bit of a different perspective being expressed. The Bible says, then the other disciple who came to the tomb first, this disciple is John. He's the one that's writing these words. It says, this other disciple who came to the tomb first, he beat Peter in the foot race, so he's fast. It's cool. (laughs) He went in also. He saw and believed. He questioned, 
He doubted, he wondered prior to that because it didn't make sense. His perception of what he saw didn't match the reality of what was being told to him. But as he goes into that tomb, he believed. The Bible says, For as yet they did not know the Scripture that he must rise again from the dead. John is telling us that he went into that tomb when he saw the claws and the handkerchief lying there but no body, that he believed what had happened. But up until that point, the Bible says he did not know the Scripture that Jesus would rise from the dead. I think it's important to understand that that term that we have here translated in English as know, in Greek it means to see or perceive. Again, we're coming back to that perception of perceive. He didn't come to an understanding of what it meant that Jesus was going to rise from the dead. Because you see, John had been told that this was going to happen. It's not as if it was, oops, surprise, nothing like this has ever been talked about. Jesus had said that he would rise from the dead. But John, along with everybody else, didn't yet understand or perceive what that could and would really mean. Because it just didn't make sense to their mind. What what do you mean, like, in a a thousand years? Because you're you're coming, you're you're the king, and and you're you're accepting all of these shouts of proclamation. Hosanna, save now. We're going to overthrow the Romans. We're going to overthrow this religious religious system, and everything's going to be good, Jesus. And then you died. Wait a minute rising from it. What did he mean? On the third day, he must rise again. Didn't, un- didn't understand it. He'd heard it, but he didn't perceive what it really meant. He couldn't grasp it. But in that moment, in that moment, the light bulb came on. He understood. He understood that, wait a minute, somebody didn't come and take Jesus' body. Jesus is not dead, but rather Jesus was alive. And I don't know, just even saying that, it just sends chills up my body. Jesus was alive. I get excited about that. John's perceptions of what he thought was true were wrong. But the resurrected Jesus changed all of that. You know what? Sometimes we can have wrong perceptions in life. Sometimes we can value the wrong things. Sometimes we can think that my way, my thinking, my thought process, my road is the right way for me. And sometimes, though, our life has to be intersected with the life of Jesus to show us that, well, wait a minute. My perception of reality really is what's wrong, and God's perception of reality is truth because it's not just a perception. It is founded upon what is real. So as Peter and John peered into the tomb, as John records that he believes They go back to their homes, still not having seen Jesus. They didn't see the physical body of the resurrected Lord yet. They didn't see him walking, talking. They have not experienced that at this point in time. But then we're told a little bit more information about someone who did see Jesus at at that moment or in that period of moments. Mary Magdalene. And she experiences quite the encounter with Jesus. Now, we don't know the exact timeline of when this happens, Um, as the way that it's written, it seems like this is kind of a a parenthetical, kind of an ellipsis, where we're given information that had previously occurred, but at some point in time, early in the morning, Mary's outside the tomb, and she is crying, and as she cries, she peers back into the tomb. Again, we don't know exactly when it's happening, but it's still in the morning, it's in this same period of time, and again, it seems like we're going back to her, and then reading more information about what had happened after that account. And so, what we see with Mary is as she peers back into the tomb, all right, she's, she's already feeling just, just so confused, very sad. Now they, all of this has happened and now the body's not even here. Goodness. And so she's just crying and weeping. All is lost. And she sees these two angels, though, when she peers back into the tomb. And the angels ask her why she's crying. Fair enough. Okay. She responds in verse 13, They have taken away my Lord. She doesn't even know who. They, okay, I do not know where they have laid him. But as soon as she said that, she turned around and she saw Jesus, but she didn't know it was Jesus because she definitely wouldn't be expecting to see him standing, walking, talking to her, okay? So she, she sees him but does not recognize him. Jesus asked Mary the same questions the angel just asked her. Why are you weeping? Are you okay? Why are you crying? Okay. Whom are you seeking? Think he knew? He knew. Okay. Sometimes Jesus asks us a question so that we'll verbalize it. That's the whole thing about prayer. 
Sometimes people ask me, well, why do I pray if, if God already knows? Because God wants us to verbalize what we're, what we're feeling. And so God will prompt us to be able to verbalize what's really going on on the inside so then he can work through that. He can work in our heart. And so I think that's what Jesus is doing here. He wants her to verbalize her grief and to verbalize the pain that she's experiencing. Okay? So he asks, whom are you seeking? Now that question, Mary thought that Jesus was the gardener, the caretaker, possibly. And she asked where Jesus' body had been taken him. She said, where, where, did they, where have they taken him? If, if you'll just tell me and show me, I, I, can, I can take care, I can anoint that body. If you'll just tell me. And then Jesus says to her one word. He speaks her name. He says, Mary. And it's that moment that for Mary, the light bulb comes on. She knew it was Jesus as she called out Rabboni, meaning teacher. Jesus was alive. And guys, sometimes what we need to hear is simply our name being spoken. As Jesus called out to Mary, we realize that he is wanting to draw her in. He's wanting to comfort her in her time of need. And what Jesus does, he gives every person an opportunity to know him, to come to understand him, and to accept him as Lord and Savior. He speaks her names. He calls out to me, he said, Derek, I care about you. In your moment of need, I am here. And your greatest moment of need is that you would be forgiven and free from sin. Not that you would never sin, but that all of those sins could be forgiven. And you could live a totally different life with different purpose, different meaning, different direction, a different result. He speaks your name. Have you responded to that? Has Jesus called your name? And have you responded to it? At the understanding that Jesus was alive, Mary wanted to hug Jesus. She tried. She just wanted to hold on to him and never let go. I, I can understand that, right? You, can, you, you read the words and you hear the hurt and you see the loss. She just wants to hold on to Jesus and never let go. But Jesus said it's not the time for that. There was still a lot that had to take place before Jesus would ascend back into heaven. Short period of time. So Jesus told Mary Magdalene, though, to do something, to go and spread word of his resurrection, to go and spread word that, yes, he really was alive, that this is really Jesus, and to tell the disciples that she had seen Jesus relaying his message to them. Wow. What a morning. <laughs> Things were now beginning to make sense, at least a little bit. The pieces are being put together. Jesus is revealing himself John is recognizing it. Others are beginning to say, wait a minute, what did Jesus say? And the pieces are being put together. Clarity out of confusion. Confidence that, wait a minute, everything that Jesus said, maybe it really will be okay. Maybe this is going to turn out all right. Why? Because Jesus was alive. It wouldn't be long, though, before he would ascend back to heaven. But he had some work to do. Now, in just a moment, we're going to wrap this up today. But I want us to go back just a few chapters in the Gospel of John to where Jesus was talking to his disciples prior to his arrest, prior to the mockery and the mock court and all the, the, just the crazy stuff that happened, prior to his beating and his torture, prior to the crucifixion, prior to the death, prior to the resurrection. John 16, starting in verse 28. Again, Jesus talking to his disciples this is before any of this has happened, and he says these words, John 16, 28. The Bible says, I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. We understand that, okay? He says, again, I leave the world and I go to the Father. Okay, so this is prophetic in the sense that this is going to be happening. And his disciples said to him, see, now you're speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. They'd been getting frustrated with Jesus because he kept telling parables and like, you're confusing us. I mean, we don't, we don't understand what you're saying completely here. What do you mean? And so when he says, I came from the Father, I've come into the world, and I'm going to go back to the Father. I say, okay, that makes sense. Okay, we knew you came from above. That makes sense. You're going back to the Father. Thank you for being plain and clear with us. Have you ever been that, that person, just dense? Okay, and he's like, just speak plainly to me. Like, that's what I need most of the time, okay? My, my wife tries to be subtle and, and drop hints. Dude, it doesn't work, okay? And, and mostly, if you're married, 
you, you get that, right? Us as guys, I mean, how, how many of you can actually pick up on subtleties, guys? Anybody? Nobody. See, no, no hands, right? Same way, the disciples. It's a bunch of dudes. No, re- no wonder they can't pick up on subtlety. Right? If, it was, if it was 12 women, it'd be totally different, okay? All right? But here they're, they're telling Jesus, okay, thank you for speaking clearly and plainly, right? His disciples said to him, see, now you're speaking plainly, using no figure of speech. Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this, we believe that you came forth from God. Okay? We know that the things that you say, we know that the things that you are describing, that it is, is from the Father, that you came from God, that you have authority, that no one even need question your words. Right? Jesus answered them, do you now believe? <laughs> And I think it's in just that way. Okay? If you say, hey, we believe, we have total confidence, everything that you say, we believe you, Jesus. Okay? And I think Jesus looks at him and he says, do you? Really? Do you really believe all of that? And now he says some hard stuff. He says, indeed, the hour is coming, yes, and has now come. So he's talking about in the future, and it is imminent. That's what he means by the hour is coming, yes, and has now come. He's saying something is going to happen in the future, and it is imminent that you will be scattered. He says, each to his own, and you will leave me alone. And yet I'm not alone, because the Father is with me. He says, you're going to leave me, you're going to just, you're going to run from me, you're going to scatter, and I'll be left all alone, except there's one who is with me, and that's the Father, the one who sent me. Verse 33, he says, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. Remember, he's talking future. In the world you will have tribulation. That confusion, uncertainty, doubt, fear, okay? All of those things, he said, that's, that's included in tribulation. You will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. <laughs> Man, those are some good words. The part that we're going to experience isn't always great. You're going to have tribulation. I'm going to have tribulation. We're going to face difficulty, but be of good cheer. Jesus said he's overcome the world. It's just one of the many passages throughout the Gospels where Jesus spoke of things to come. Because you see, he wanted his followers to know that everything that would happen was already known. And I think that's really important for our understanding as well. Everything that would happen was already known. It was just being made clear because there were so many perceptions that did not match reality. What happened at the end of Jesus' earthly life? It was not a surprise to him. The betrayal The mockings, the beatings, the torture, the crown of thorns, the cross, all of that. It was all known. It was not a surprise. And while Jesus knew how hard all of that would be for him, for those who would follow him, he also knew it would be hard. He wanted them to live with confidence, assurance, and victory, not uncertainty and confusion. Jesus wanted them to live in a place of dependence upon him, but not confusion. In verse 32 that we just read, Jesus said that the hour was coming when his followers would be scattered and he would be left all alone, except for the presence of God the Father. Did that happen? Did that happen? It did, didn't it? We could read kind of toward the end of each of those Gospels. When Jesus was arrested, what did the disciples do? They ran. They fled. We're next, right? We're accomplices. They're arresting him. They're coming for us because we're with him. And so they ran and hid. Peter even went so far as denying that he even knew Jesus, right? On three different times. Peter said, wait a minute, you were, you were with that Jesus guy that they just arrested. And three times he denied, correct? And the third time cursing when he was asked if he knew Jesus. I don't know that blankety, I don't know, blankety blank blank. And he curses at the same time. Wow. You know what? This is the same Peter that two months later is going to preach to thousands with boldness, with conviction, and with confidence in Jesus. Preaching in the power of the Holy Spirit, not afraid of being identified with Christ, not afraid of persecution, not even afraid of death. What changed? Jesus was alive. (laughs) It changed him because Jesus was alive. The resurrection of Jesus makes all the differences. It changes our doubts, it changes our worries, it changes our fears, our uncertainties, our insecurities. 
all of those things that far too often weigh us down, it changes those things to hope, confidence, strength, and victory in Jesus. It changes everything. This morning we sang that classic hymn, Victory in Jesus. And the words are just as true today as they were when they were written. And they're just as true the day that Jesus rose from the dead. Victory in Jesus. Because in him, everything changes because he has won the victory. And guys, that's our big takeaway for this morning. Okay? One thing, very simple. In Jesus, everything changes because Jesus has won the victory. Man, everything can be made new. Despair, doubt, confusion, uncertainty, all of that can be transformed. But it's only through Jesus. It's the difference between Saturday and Sunday. It's the difference between confusion and confidence. It's the difference between death and life. So as you sit here this morning, each of us with our own sets of struggles, each of us with our own sets of concerns and worries, let me just say, because of Jesus and his victory over sin and death, there is hope for tomorrow. Yes, there is hope for tomorrow. After all, the story of Easter is a story that is full of hope. And it's not a hope in the sense of, I would really like to see this work out, if all possible. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. It's not that I hope so. But this is a hope in the sense that I can look forward to what will be because Jesus has already guaranteed the future. As he continued to tell his disciples of what would come, he knew. He already knew. And he knows what will befall you and me as well. He knows our future. And he can be trusted with our future. Do you remember verse 33 of John 16? These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. And that term may have peace, it's the same meaning as you will have peace. It's not that you might have peace. It's that because you are in me, you now have that freedom. You now have the ability to have peace. That's what it means. You may have peace. You will have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. One very simple question. Have you placed your faith in the one who has overcome the world? Have you placed true faith in Jesus? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, as we look again at this account of the resurrection of your Son, Lord, we are thankful that we can read truth, that we can know truth, and we're thankful that through your Spirit we can understand truth. God, the power of the resurrection is so very real. And the historicity and the fact of the resurrection itself has thousands of witnesses that bear truth to what you have done and millions upon millions of witnesses worldwide for countless centuries whose lives have been changed because of the power of the resurrected Son. And God, I'm thankful that we worship the Lord who is risen, that he is alive, and that he is not still in the tomb. God, this is what makes Christianity different from any other religion. There is one reality, many perceptions in this world, but there is only one truth. God, we're thankful that Jesus himself had declared that there is really only one way when he said that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to you except through him. God, that makes it very exclusive. We either trust Jesus or we don't. And he's the only way. He said so himself. God, I'm thankful, God, that so many years ago you changed my life. Lord, that belief was possible because of your grace and because of the gift of faith and that I can even know you. God, for that I'm so thankful. But Lord, I think of those that might be here and maybe they're in this place of confusion and doubt and uncertainty and fear. And God, they just don't know what is right because, man, the world is so it can be so confusing. So many mixed messages and so many false statements and things that are touted to be true, but God, are, are shown over and over again to be false. The world calls good evil and evil good. 
And God, it can just be a confusing mess. And Lord, I pray for those that are here this morning, God, and they are searching. They want to know truth. They want to know you. But God, it just hasn't been clear. God, that, that was the case of every single one of us. But Lord, you can change all that. Lord, you changed it at the tomb. For Mary, for John, for others who had come to see and understand what you had done. They changed that confusion and uncertainty into confidence and victory. And Lord, I pray that today might be the day. God, that clarity would come and that lives would be changed. Lord, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, there's a couple of things that we're going to do here. In just a second, we are going to partake in what we call the Lord's Supper. Sometimes we reference it as communion. And this is a time of remembrance. And so even as I was praying, as we recollect and as we think about our own relationship,